um, it always starts in the bullpen. It always starts with your history, with what you have and what you don't have. Um, so the catcher is, he's gonna actually see you warm up in the bullpen. And with that, he's gonna have a good feel for what you've got going, whether you have a command of your breaking ball, you have a, a, you're repeating your delivery, you have a chance to throw to both sides of the plate, he'll have a, a feel before he goes into the game. Then, and this is something that just always drove me nuts. And when I was really young, I always thought that the older catcher for some god awful reason, whether he was out of college or I was the high school kid, I'd give him more credit uh -huh. on what he wanted to throw, whether or not I wanted to throw it at all. In my first two years, I didn't even throw a, a breaking ball. So it was fastball changeup. So if I had confidence in that pitch that he suggested then I could throw it if it, it made sense to me. But you have to have a wherewithal, your thought process, to what you want to throw, what you can throw, what you have confidence in. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that comes with what we've been working with at Premier is developing a delivery that you have confidence in. And that's the only way you're ever going to have confidence in your off-speed pitch is if you repeat your delivery. Mm -hmm. So if, say, Chris is my catcher, and, and I'm struggling to land a breaking ball in the, the pin, even though I have to show it in a game to show a hitter that I've got another pitch other than a fastball. If I just have a fastball on a thrower, I will throw it in an account that's not going to hurt me. I'm going to be up in the, in the count with strikes, or, and then I'll try to throw a breaking ball, or I'll try to throw a changeup. But inevitably, it comes down to what you own and what your history is. That makes sense, right? Coach, go ahead. I had a, I had a guy tell me once that um, a good pitch thrown with 100% confidence is better than a great pitch that you're not too sure about. So, so true. So, so true. Um, I, think, I think that as, from, a catcher, from a catching standpoint, it's really important in, in bullpen situations that I have an opportunity to catch every guy on our, on our staff because they're all going to have different strengths and weaknesses. And I need to know what they throw and how accurately they're able to throw, what kind of control they have in other words, um, and how confident that they are in their stuff. And uh, to go back to your introduction, Greg, I think that, that the relationship between the pitcher and the catcher understanding the pitcher's strengths and, and building and working from that those and secondarily attacking what weaknesses we identify in the hitters, that's how we're gonna be we're gonna be most successful. But we have to we have to have confidence and to Jack's point, if we're about to throw something that we don't have confidence in, let's do it in a situation that you know we're not gonna get hurt. That makes right. sense. Um, let me let me build off that real quick. Um, as I see it, you have two things. You have your strength as a pitcher, and then you have what you perceive to be as the hitter's weakness. When uh, you're going about attacking a hitter, uh, which one uh, should be informing you first and foremost? Like, say we got a really good fastball hitting team. I'm a fastball pitcher, or maybe for some of our young guys all we have is a fastball. Um, so how do we uh, go about navigating that? Well, let me start, Jack. Um, what I would say is if you have, uh, number one, to answer your question, it's the pitcher's strengths first, from, from my perspective. Uh, you can't attack the weak, if, if, if the, if the uh, report on a hitter is he can't hit a slider, and I don't throw a slider, then how are we gonna get this guy out? You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's, uh, that's where I would start is what my strengths are. I have to go with my strengths. And then second to that would be, would be the, uh, the hitter's weakness. And remember, all hitters, they all have weaknesses. And it's not like they're going to make a square contact every time you throw a pitch out over the plate. So if you have confidence in your ability and you have confidence in a pitch, go with it. If, if he happens to hit it, he happens to hit it. You know, every, well, they say every squirrel finds an acorn. It's, it's true. 
that, that'll happen. But it's important also to look at the hitters and find out what you think their, their uh, weakness is. When a hitter stands in there and say he's a thick bodied guy, he's a strong and he's open, more than likely you can pitch him away unless he's diving into it. So be aware of what that strength could possibly be. Obviously, if he's a big guy, he might have some power, especially at the, the lower levels. Um, be up on that. Know what, but again, you're gonna go with your strength. And I can't tell you how many times, now this is before the aluminum bat, but how many times that they were saying in pro ball, you gotta pitch inside, you gotta pitch inside. You got to try to jam because the, the last thing you want is somebody to you know make square contact out over the meat of, of the bat. So you have to go in. And again, it comes back to that delivery. If you're inconsistent with your delivery and you're not on time, I don't care. If you're not on time, all, the best you can ever be is an area pitcher. But if you're on time, then you have some fun and start to be able to put that ball where you want it. As a kid, it was always taught stay low, stay low, stay low to get the ground ball, keep the ball out of the air. And then if you were a little off in your timing and you elevated the ball, a guy could hit it in the air, but it was always stay low, stay low and work in and out and stay out of the meat of the, the plate. But that's because if I can repeat my delivery, I can have that way. If I don't repeat my delivery, it's just area command. You're just, you're keeping your fingers crossed and you're hoping that you throw a strike. You know, I would, I would add that um, in 30 plus years of throwing batting practice to players with nothing more than a, you know, 65 mile an hour fastball, um, that, that one pitch, that one velocity can become four different pitches because you can throw it outside and high or outside and low. You can throw it inside and high, inside and low. And in the same way that if you were standing on the, the uh, edge of the freeway, on a four lane freeway, a car that goes by in the far lane away from you at 55 miles an hour appears to be going you know, a certain speed. You bring a car in the lane closest to you and he's going 55 miles an hour, man, it seemed like that guy was going 150. And that's the same way an inside versus an outside fastball can be. Um, so honestly, without ever throwing a change up or ever throwing a breaking ball, because I really, I really didn't have those to work with, uh, just throwing batting practice to guys, you could find where their weaknesses were and just using a crappy fastball. You throw it in the right spot, you can beat them. I like that. My, my uh, next question was kind of following up on that is is i think for a pitcher what we typically have uh is location in away up down and pitch speed you know kind of fast middle slow mm -hmm. um and uh we don't typically have advanced scouting reports i think as jack was kind of alluding to we kind of have to be superficial in our assessments of hitters um, we see big guy, we see small guy, we see athletic guy. Um, and then we read, where are we in the order? Are we the three hitter or are we the seven hitter? Um, and that's kind of how we have to operate in terms of, um, kind of a scouting report. When you see uh, a three hitter and say you have fast and slow, that's all you have. You have a fastball and you have something that comes in relatively slow. You see the three hitter. Um, how would you start about going uh, about attacking him in say his first at bat? Low, low. Yeah, make him make him earn it. You know, we always know that you know as you elevate the ball above the the waist, you can make a bad hitter a good hitter. We're giving this guy the credit because he's in the three hole that he's one of their better hitters. So the last thing I want to do is give him a cookie up and say, oh, yeah, as he drives that out of the park or he hits it in the alley going, oh, this, this is a good hitter. I want to make him earn it. So I'm going to try to stay low in the zone. And if I get too deep in the count, I'm going to make him earn it. I'll just give him a cookie and hope that he hits it at somebody, knowing that 
you know, a 300 hitter fails seven times out of 10. So I will make him earn it. I am not going to walk that son of a gun because a walk is, is it's just, it's a freebie. And I don't want to give a hitter a freebie. A uh, question, uh, follow-up question for you, Sperry, because you've kind of uh, grown as, a, as a, a hitting coach through kind of different phases in hitting and in kind of uh, this launch era, uh, era of, of, of swing where we're dealing with um, attack angles of plus 35 sometimes. It seems to me that a lot of our three and four hitters who kind of pride themselves on, on going deep have a pretty large hole in their swing at about the letters. Um, uh, talk about how um, watching a hitter swing might inform um, maybe a, a, a pitch height or inside, outside, hard, soft. Sure. Well, that's, that is the scouting report. I, I, and I'm not kidding you when I say this, I did not see a scouting report until uh, I was coaching in college. So I made it through four years of, well, five years of division one baseball and a year of minor league baseball, never saw a scouting report. So the only scouting report you had was what your eyes told you about um, what a hitter's swing might be like or what his strengths or weaknesses might be like. Uh, as well as the body type, you know, if a guy's six four and he weighs 220 pounds and he's hitting third or fourth in the lineup, you can make some assumptions that yeah, maybe this guy's got some power um, compared to a player who might be five nine and 150 and a switch hitter who drag bunts all the time and plays center field. Um, so you can you start to form some ideas about your competition based on the way they look and the way they're built and the way they swing. And I think that, that arguably, well, to me, there's no question that the two guys that have the best angle or view to uh, read a player's swing is going to be the pitcher and the catcher. And that's why that team is so, so important. The, the team within a team, to me, is the pitcher and the catcher. And, uh, um, you know, is, is the player standing close to the plate? because he might be telling you that uh, he doesn't hit the away pitch very well, so he's going to cheat on it. Um, or maybe he's telling you that uh, he really likes to turn every pitch into an inside pitch because he wants to pull it. Um, sometimes in my day, nobody stood with an, with an open stance. Nobody. Um, there were a lot of closed stances throughout baseball, even in the big leagues. Uh, and, and, I was reading something this morning and preparing for this that, you know, some guys with open stances stand that way because they, they want the ball inside and they're going to cheat to pull it. And I have to tell you that I've found it. I found the opposite to be true because over the last say decade and a half uh, with so many players starting with an open stance, they tend to, you know, cut across the plate in an effort to get, back online and they just jam themselves on they're, they're incapable of hitting middle end pitches. So knowing what I know at my age and having watched that happen, if, if a hitter came up to the plate, he had an open stance, I'm probably going to be prepared to go in on that player and jam him uh, maybe sooner than I would have two decades ago, just because of what I think it's created in our, in our swing mechanics with all these open stances. But, 